Good morning. <clears throat> it's good to see you all today. My name is Chad Mason. I'm uh, the missions pastor here, and I'm so happy to be with you. This is my first time to preach as one of your pastors, and so I'm so excited, so excited to be here. Uh, it is my two-month anniversary today for joining the staff. Two months today. And uh, what a whirlwind it has been uh, getting here. We closed on a house in December 19th, and so we moved in just before Christmas, and uh, we still have lots of boxes. If you uh, want to help, you can ask Elise. Uh, we have lots of things. No, I'm kidding. Elise. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. Um, well, guys, we have had a crazy uh, last few months, um, but the story we're going to talk about today is, is really one that's hard to connect to in the culture that we live in today. I want to start this morning's message by telling you a story from, from 2018. There was a young man named John Chow. Maybe you've heard his story. The first time I heard the story was on the news, and it talked about a young man who was an adventure seeker who tried to contact this little island in the middle of the, the West Indies uh, Ocean, uh, the Indian Ocean, and it was called um, the North Centralese Island. And uh, the story went that he had tried to do something that was just really crazy and thrill-seeking, and it had cost him his life. And if you thought about, if, you, if you've been around kind of the thrill-seeking kind of culture, the adventure seekers, it really is not surprising that some people do crazy things and they die doing it, right? You know, people fall off mountains or they, they hit trees while they're skiing. Um, you, you think it's sad, but it's not a story that's uncommon. This is a picture of John. And uh, a few weeks after the first story hit, I learned that that really wasn't the whole story. That John was a missionary and John had been, been praying for this people group for over 10 years. He was sent out by his church and a missions organization. He'd been praying, preparing for years to make contact with this unreached, untouched people group in the North Sintelese Islands. And so this was a group that was so sheltered and so closed that nobody had ever had contact with them and survived. There was a, some fishermen whose boat sank near their island in 2006, and all the fishermen were killed when they landed on the island. They took a military team to go there to recover the bodies of those, those islanders, and that's how John first heard about these people. So could you imagine what it took for somebody like John who heard about them and knew that God wanted to reach these people, that God had a heart for this nation that had never heard the gospel in their entire history? And so he began praying and preparing, for himself, preparing himself. He did missions in Myanmar, and he even did lots of, lots of different places where he could learn and grow. He took survival classes, and he learned how to live on, on, on uh, filtered water, and he, even, he did everything he could to prepare himself for this mission. And yet all we knew was that the day that he landed, he died. It's a crazy story, right? Could you imagine if John was one of your children, one of your grandchildren? What if he was your brother or sister? What if he was a friend that attended this church? How would you feel? What would you think? Would you think he was silly and foolish and crazy? You might. And he might have been. I don't know. I never met him. But today we're going to hear a story from Scripture that, that has the same kind of passions. I entitled this, the, the sermon today, The Tale of Two, uh, let me look at it so make sure, The Tale of Two Opposing Passions. Because when, when you talk about people who are willing to kill to protect their, their story, or their, to protect their faith, and people who are willing to die to confirm their faith, you have this, this really powerful combination of forces. And today in Scripture, we're going to read about the first believer who died for his faith. So turn with me, um, we're gonna, I want to start in Matthew 10, because the, the, the idea of, of that we might experience persecution as Christians was something that Jesus warned us about, and I want to start there. So look with me uh, at Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 16. It says this, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You'll be handed over to local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, notice the word there, not if, when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father, his child, and children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. That's a huge verse. It's one that we should write on the tablet of your heart. The one that stands firm to the end 
will be saved. Verse 23 says, when you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. You know, most martyrs, even Jesus himself, they come from lowly and unknown beginnings. Though there are a few exceptions, many are mostly remembered because of their death, more so than their life. The sermon today is going to challenge each one of our hearts, and I hope that you'll ask yourself the question, if the Lord chose to test me in such a way, how would I respond? Would I be found faithful? And that question should be a question you wrestle with probably for the rest of your life. It's not an easy answer. I want to share with you that the, the, the whole concept of this word martyrdom is built on this, class, this, this violent clash between these two worlds. One party that is so passionate about their belief that they're willing to kill those who threaten it. And another party who's so passionate about their belief that they're willing to confirm it with their own death. Our primary text today is found in Acts chapter 6. And we're going to learn about this man named Stephen. Pastor Jason introduced Stephen to us last night, or last Sunday. He was one of the, the, the men chosen as deacons to help the, the elders, to help the leaders of the church in Jerusalem when they were overwhelmed with the needs of the people around them. If you remember, the description was that they were chosen to help feed the Hellenistic Jews and help make sure that the, the, the food distribution that was happening daily was fairly uh, distributed, that people had what they needed. And it specifically said, listen, if you remember, it specifically said that they did not, the, 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 the disciples did not want to um, turn away from their primary jobs of preaching and teaching and praying to wait tables, was kind of the, the language. If you, do you guys remember that? So Stephen was one of the guys that was chosen to do what? To wait tables, to take care of the, the distribution, the, the, the logistical problem of trying to give food to a lot of people on a daily basis. So keep that in mind. That's what Stephen was chosen to do. Now let's look at this description here found in, in Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 8. It says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Sounds like your normal food server, doesn't it? Opposi opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen. Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit of God gave him as he spoke. I love this. This is your normal waiter doing his normal job, filled with the Spirit and doing amazing things, signs and wonders and having wisdom that the Spirit gave him. So verse 11, they secretly persuaded some men to say that we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law, and they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. All those who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw his face was like the face of an angel. Look at this description of Stephen. It's, it's so different than what you might expect as the guy chosen to replace and help the teachers and the prophets and the preachers. And this guy is standing in front of the Sanhedrin about to give one of the longest sermons in all of Scripture. Chapter 7 is fully dedicated to Stephen's sermon. And it's 60 verses long. It's longer than Peter's sermon at, Pe sermon at Pentecost. And so we get this powerful sermon from Stephen, who is, who is a guy that was chosen to help do the work of the ministry, not necessarily to teach and preach. I, I want to highlight this because I want you to know that, that anyone who serves God faithfully is qualified by their service, not by their title. Do you understand what I'm saying we as a body represent so many individuals that God has called, and we need every one of you to see the kingdom of God advance in the place that God has put us. Every one of us has a role from the least to the greatest, and sometimes the least becomes the greatest. Scripture tells us, it doesn't tell us anything about Stephen's origins, his family, his vocation, how old he was, his social class. It just tells us of his faithfulness to God. And the description is amazing. Luke, the author of the book, it tries really hard here to tie Stephen to Jesus. Listen to some of the things that are similar. The false witnesses, the accusations against Stephen were the same accusations brought against Jesus. 
The, the works, the signs and wonders that Stephen performs brings to mind what? The signs and war- wonders that Jesus performed and the other apostles were performing. The face, the description that his face was like that of an angel. What does that bring to your mind? It brings to mind the moment where Jesus was the transfiguration and his face was glowing as he met with Moses and Elijah. Luke is making, making a very clear role, uh, um, uh, position here that Stephen is tied closely to Jesus. Early in the chapter, Luke tells us about the conflict that had risen up between the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews. Remember, Jason gave us a description last week that the Hellenistic Jews were people from out of town. They, came, they were Jews that came from all around the world. They spoke a lot of different languages. Stephen very likely was one of those. And so Stephen is not even a Jew from Jerusalem. He's a, probably a, 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 a Greek-speaking Jew from outside of Jerusalem. And so I just want you to, I want to just make this really clear it's that Stephen is an outsider to the discipleship, to the disciples group. He's not one of the 12 apostles. He's very likely not one who had been with them from the beginning. You remember when they picked Matthias, the replacement for Judas? They tried to, among the disciples of Jesus, they picked the ones from the ones who were with them from the beginning. There were many disciples who had been with Jesus who weren't one of the 12. This was not one of those. Stephen came from out of town. And so I want you to see he's a second or third generation believer. What does that mean? What it means is that he didn't come to faith by Christ in front of him. He came to Christ through a disciple of Jesus, making him a second generation or third generation believer. Does that make sense to you? I want you to know that because all of us are some sort of generation. We're many generations removed from the first apostles, right? And yet somebody led you to faith. Somebody shared the gospel with you, and you became another generation. And as we talk about sharing the gospel with our friends and family, I want you to think about this idea of what are the generations that come out of your ministry? Who are the second generation from you? Who are the third and fourth generations that are from your ministry, from the people that you share the gospel with? And what does it look like if we were praying that God would give each one of us four generations? What would it look like if I was praying that every single believer here would see four generations of faith in their lifetime? That'd be a pretty powerful thing, wouldn't it? We're not just talking about sharing the gospel with one or two people. We're talking about praying that God would move through the people that you love and the people that you share the gospel with and that that fourth generation would be our goal. So I want you to see Stephen is a second or third generation believer. Isn't it interesting? Ask this question. Why is it that Stephen, who is not one of Jesus' disciples, He's not one of the 12. How is it that he becomes the focal point of this story? Do you remember that in the description we read in chapter 6, early in chapter 6, that the disciples were devoting themselves daily to worship and prayer, and they were preaching daily? If you remember the verse that Jason read last week, they were preaching daily in the temple and from house to house. Do you remember that? So put this in, in right perspective. Stephen is preaching alongside who? Who else? The other disciples, right? That means Peter and John and the other guys who have been the focal point of the first several chapters of Acts, they're there with him. They are with him. So why is it that Stephen is the focal point? Does it strike you as strange that he's the one that gets in trouble here? It seems very clear that Jesus, that Stephen, as a second or third generation disciple, has become one of the most visible and capable spokespersons of the new church. Is that amazing to you? It amazes me because, again, it, it highlights to me that every single one of us, regardless of title, is measured by our faithfulness, not by our position. And so here we have this powerful testimony of a guy that we really don't know much about, and he becomes the focus. And one of the biggest stories in all of the New Testament, if you combine chapters 6 and 7 and all the verses, this is one of the longest narratives on one particular story you can find in the entire New Testament. Luke wants you to know this story inside and out, because not only is this story very important, but what comes out of it. There's a guy we learned about at the end of this story one of the persecutors, one of the ones that kills Stephen in the end, there's this guy that becomes kind of important later on. And so even a persecutor like Saul can become an apostle. What a shocking revelation this story gives us. Not only is the story of Stephen so powerful, but the guy that helps to kill him writes almost everything that we have as the foundation of our theology. So let's start looking at Stephen's story. Before we get there, I want to say something very clearly. The test of our faithfulness is not in our degrees, 
our years of study, sort in our titles. It's entirely based on how we respond when we face trials and difficulties of many kinds. How you walk through your life defines your faithfulness, not your denomination, not how long you've been a believer, not what church you belong to or how much you've given. Our faithfulness in times of difficulty is what defines who we are. Stephen is emboldened to give a passionate sermon, and it give, he gives a summary of how God has called Abraham and his descendants, the Israelites. He focuses on how God provides for the Israelites, despite the Israelites' failings. He mentions all these guys. Listen, he listens. He talks about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Aaron. He finishes with David's temple preparations and Solomon's building of the temple. It's a huge, long sermon, and you should read it. It's almost a creation to Christ kind of a story, starting with Abraham, ending with Jesus. But at this point, here at the end of the, of the sermon, Stephen gives this powerful summary. Look with me at verses 51 through 53. Again, he's highlighted all of these Old Testament people, all these Old Testament stories. He's talked about these prophets, and then in verse 51, he gets to the point. And this is what he says to these teachers of the law, the Sanhedrin. He says to them, you stiff-necked people. <laughs> By the way, if you start like that, it doesn't typically go well. <laughs> your hearts and your ears are still, still, look at the word, still. It's like they've, they've never really gotten it. You're, they're still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You, look at the word, always resist the Holy Spirit. Now these are men he's talking to who are passionate about their faith. These Sanhedrin, they're, one, they're some of the strongest leaders of their day. They know the Bible that they had, the Old Testament, inside and out. They probably literally had memorized it word for word. Do you know that? These guys knew God's word probably better than all of us, at least the Old Testament version. But their hearts could not understand what it meant. What a terrible thing that people can know God's word and not know God. And so he says, you stiff-necked people, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Verse 52, was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now, listen to this line, you have betrayed and murdered him. How do you think these guys are responding? How are they feeling? The Holy Spirit is not speaking to them. What they feel and hear is accusation and judgment coming from this guy, Stephen, who's a Greek speaker, and they are filled with indignation and anger. Listen to 53. He continues, You have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. What a terrible thing to hear and to see. You know, that happens today. There are some of us who know God's word. We have read the words of Jesus for our whole life and still we don't do what he tells us to do. What a terrible thing to be within reach of the gospel, to be re within reach of salvation and not know it. To have it in your hands, to have it in your heart and still not be impacted by it. Those are the people that Stephen's talking to. And as you know, Stephen's word here brings this conflict to a violent confrontation. Think about how Stephen feels here in this moment. When you're reading the story, does Stephen feel nervous? You get the idea that he's afraid? Is he cowering? What, what, do you, what, do you, what do you feel Stephen has here? He's filled with power and strength and his words get stronger and stronger and stronger and you wonder what is going on with this guy? Doesn't he know if he would just shut his mouth he would live till tomorrow? But he doesn't, does he? Why? What is it that drives Stephen to continue and actually get, get, get worse? His language gets harsher from here. He's already insulted their ancestors and insulted them. He's already called them out and said, you know the truth, but you don't act by it. You've heard the gospel, but you don't live by it. It doesn't impact your actions. And therefore, you are a stiff-necked people that doesn't even hear the Holy Spirit. And he continues. So listen to verse 54. Things get really bad here. It says, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. Has anyone ever gnashed their teeth at you? I, I don't know. I don't know that very well. I'm getting this like a kind of a kind of a thing. You know, they're angry. 
But Stephen, listen to the language, full of the Holy Spirit, lifted up. He looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, he said, I see heaven opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He's saying he has a vision where he can see Jesus standing next to God's throne. And this pushes them over the edge. At this, they covered their ears. They yelled at the top of their voices. They rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And here's Luke's introduction. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. This is an important guy, by the way. If he's not highlighted in your Bible, you should highlight him right there. We'll talk a little bit about this Saul before we finish today. But it really introduces one of the most important figures of the New Testament. Maybe, obviously behind Jesus, but then like Peter and Paul are kind of like the other two really main guys. And this is the guy that's standing here holding the coats of the men who are stoning Stephen. 59. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Where have you heard that before? The same words that Jesus gave, right? Verse 60, then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And thus, Stephen, the deacon, Stephen, the guy that was supposed to serve bread, Stephen, the guy that was supposed to help and take care of all the logistics, Stephen becomes the first martyr of the church. He's the first one who walked in Jesus' footsteps in that manner. He's the first one that lived out that Matthew 10 passage that we started where he said, you will be persecuted, you will be hated by men, you will be delivered to the authorities on my behalf. Stephen, the Greek speaker, not one of the 12, is the first one to live this out. Think about the honor. Think about the the sacrifice Think about the love that he had for his Lord and think about the Holy Spirit moving inside of him that gave him the words to say that literally caused his death. Stephen becomes the first martyr, but he would not be the last. You know, out of those 12 original disciples, 11 of them died martyrs' deaths. John is the only one that didn't die a martyr. And you might remember that John was tried, that they tried to kill him twice. He just survived. They threw him in a pot of boiling oil. He survived that. And they put him on an island where he was supposed to die. And he outlived the emperor. All 12 experienced persecution on a manner that was very much life-threatening and cost all but one their physical life. Let me ask you just a logistical question. Was Stephen acting foolishly? Was his plan just all broken up and messed up? When I was in college, I wrote a, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite stories of all time is, is, a, is a story of martyrs from 1956. Five men uh, were trying to reach a tribe in, in uh, the Amazon jungle in Ecuador. Uh, you probably heard the story. It included Nate Saint and Jim Elliott and, and Roger Eudorian and, and a few other guys. And they, they'd spent a lot of time preparing. When they got to that beach, the, the Indians... Uh, the Alka was what they were called. Now they're called the Warani. The Warani tribe responded with violence. After a few interactions, they killed all five men. And, and it was a really crazy story. It was one of the most compelling stories of our time because as a result of that, Time Magazine published this story about these missionaries and it led the greatest, um, the greatest, what's the right word? Response towards missions in world history. Do you know that? That event in 1956 caused over 22,000 young men and women and uh, two years later at Urbana to to respond to a call to become missionaries. It became the ground force event for some some of the organizations you've probably heard of, like Crew. Have you heard of Campus Crusade for Christ? Bill Bright was part of that. Uh, a whole bunch of other amazing organizations that that were born out of that event. Young men and women, Bill Bright being one of those, saying this is a moment where we have to do something. There are people in the world who are dying, have never heard the gospel, and we have to go to them. 22,000 young men and women chose to become missionaries because of that event. Something similar happens here. Uh, Sorry, I was telling you, when I was in college, I I wrote a paper on that event. 
And I was really smart, you know? I'd done a lot of reading, I'd read a lot of books, and uh, so I wrote in my paper that, that those five missionaries had made a mistake. That those five missionaries, if they had waited a little longer, if they had prepared a little better, there was a Warani woman that, had, that was working with Nate Saint's sister, Rachel, and they were learning the language. They could have gone back, her name was Deuma. They could have gone back with Deuma, and it, she could have been the bridge. Maybe they wouldn't have had to die. And so my paper concluded that if they had taken time, it was an intercultural communications paper, if, my, if, if they had taken their time, maybe they wouldn't have had to die and it would have been okay. How do you think my paper went? <laughs> I, got a, I got a good grade on, the, on the, the paper and a bad grade on the conclusion. So how do, you, how do you underestimate or how do you measure what the Holy Spirit's doing? It's foolishness to the world. You think about Stephen. Could he have been wiser? Could he have done things differently? I think the answer is no. The answer is no because it wasn't him who was doing this for his own good. He was being led by the Holy Spirit that was pushing him and and drawing him and he was responding to it in faithfulness. Recognize that the Holy Spirit was powerfully at work through this entire interaction. He gave Stephen the boldness Matthew 10 said he gave him the words to say. He gave him the courage to pray that God would forgive his murderers at the end. That kind of courage is impossible. It's not because Stephen was such a great guy that he could do what no one else could do. It's because he was filled with the Spirit of God in the moment of need. As a result of Stephen's death, the ministry model and the scope of the kingdom growth changed in the church dramatically. You remember the verse that starts Acts, Acts 1.8, it's the thesis verse. Pastor Jason's mentioned it, it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Up until this moment where Stephen dies, all of the ministry of the church has been where? Just in Jerusalem. Do you understand that God used this terrible moment to drive his church outwards, to be where it needed to go, and it still continues today. What God started on that moment with Stephen's death continues today. There are still places in the world that have never heard the gospel. We call them unreached people groups. They're places that have never been touched. They have less than 2% evangelical Christians within them, and then there's places like the one that John Chow went to that have never been contacted with the gospel. And so one of our priorities and missions today is to try to get the gospel to the places where it's never been. It's to the very ends of the earth. We have missionaries that have been raised up within this church that are going to those nations. And some of them have this passion to go to where there's never been work established before, to unreached peoples and places. Praise God for that because it takes extraordinary effort to go to those places. You know, all the easy ones have been reached. I tell that to people all the time. If it's easy to get to, or if the people are kind, guess what? They probably already have a strong, uh, de- developing um, church within them. You might think about, like, our church. How long has this church been here? I think around 125 years, right? Since this church was established. The people that brought this church, that established this church, were people who were moving to the area and wanted to, to do something new, to build a lighthouse for the gospel in this place. And we're the, we are the, the beneficiaries and, in some ways, the results of their work. There are some places in the world where that's never happened. There are people on the, on the planet who've never heard the name of Jesus in their own language and culture. Look what happens here, Acts chapter 8. We'll go just a few more verses. On that day, this is the day that Stephen died, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen. They mourned deeply for him. Look at verse 3. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both women and men and put them in prison. Look at verse 4. But those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. You should say amen, because our faith, every single one of our faith is a result of that verse. 
If you back the chain up and you go back and you follow link after link after link, eventually you get to this verse where all of us could say our faith was founded. If it had never left Jerusalem, the gospel very likely would have never gotten to our ears. Do you know that? If it wasn't for the death of Stephen, the gospel probably would never got to our ancestors and our family members. It probably never would have gotten this far. What was Jesus thinking? What was God thinking? He was thinking about us. He was thinking about the, more, the generations of faithful followers that will come beyond us. He's thinking about that Revelation chapter 7 verse that says, Before the throne of God, there are people from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation gathered before God saying, Worthy is the Lamb. That is what he was thinking. I want to go back and tell you a little bit more about this guy, John Chow. You know, John had been preparing for a long time. He, he went to such great a, a, attempts to hide everything. He didn't want to be famous because of this. He actually started an adventurer's blog so that if something happened to him, people would think he was an out of, uh, just a crazy adventurer rather than thinking he was a missionary trying to do something that was illegal because it was illegal for him to go to that island. The Indian government made it illegal for there to be outside interaction with these people. So John had been preparing. He'd, he'd, he'd hired some fishermen who were willing to get close enough. He had a kayak that he had put stuff. He had actually landed on the island and buried things he might need. Uh, he cached some, some food and some things he might need if he was going to be there for a while. So he'd, he'd already landed and, and done some things in secret. And then the day that he wanted to contact them, he, he got in his kayak off the fishing boat and he kayaked to close to the village. And he called out, and some of the villagers came out, and he, had, he threw some gifts to them. Someone had told him that if he gave gifts, it might make them respond to him better. So he gave them gifts, and, and he, he talked to them for a while with his broken Centalese that he had tried to learn from some other areas, um, near, nearby language and cultures. And the people were, they had their bows, but they didn't have them strung. So he felt pretty confident that they weren't trying to kill him yet. But then he noticed they started to put their, their, the strings on their bows. And so he started to back up his kayak. He said, but one young man took his bow and flung an arrow at him, and it landed in his Bible, his waterproof Bible that was in the kayak with him. And he said, at that point, I thought I needed to back up some more. <laughs> so he backed off a little more, and he wrote in his journal that night that the tip of the arrow went through his Bible, and it landed. The, the last page that was cut was on a verse that says this. It's in Isaiah 65. It says, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread up my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. Later that day, he decided to try again. So he got back in the kayak and he, he rode towards the people and they were angry and furious. And so he thought maybe the kayak was too imposing. So he got out of the kayak and he was standing shoulder deep, talking to them, talking to them. And they were really angry. So eventually he swam back to the fishing boat because the kayak had floated away. Well, in the kayak was his Bible. In the kayak was his passport. In the kayak was several things he thought he might need. And so that night when he was on the boat, in the fishing boat, this is what he wrote. He said, the plan now is to rest and to sleep on the boat. And in the morning, they're going to drop me off by my cachet. Then I'll walk along the beach to the same hut that I've been giving gifts to. This is what he says. It's weird. He said, no, actually, it's natural. He said, I'm scared. There I said it. He said, I'm also frustrated and uncertain. Is it worth me going on foot to meet these people now that they've attached me to the gifts? Yet, Lord, Lord, yet you will be close. If you want me to get actually shot or killed with an arrow, so be it. I think I could be more useful alive, though. But to you, God, I give all the glory, whatever happens. In all caps, it says, I don't want to die. Would it be wiser to leave and let someone else continue? What do you think he says? He says, no, I don't think so. I'm stuck here anyway. I don't have a passport. <laughs> It's funny how your mind kind of goes through legitimate and logical. Later that evening, John writes another entry, and he says, watching the sunset, it's beautiful. He says, I'm crying a little bit. I'm wondering if this will be the last sunset I see. He, he continues, God, I don't want to die. Who will take my place if I do? 
He's not worried about dying because he might lose out on the, his future. He's worried about what will happen to these people if no one is caring about them. Why did a little kid shoot at me today? His high-pitched voice lingers in my head. Father, forgive him and any of the people on this island who try to kill me. Especially forgive them if they succeed. Lord, strengthen me as I need your strength and protection and guidance and all that you give and all that you are. He prays this, whoever comes after me to take my place, whether it's tomorrow or some other day, give them a double anointing and bless them mightily. I have a link here to his story on persecution.com. If you want to read the whole story, it really is a powerful story. John died that day. The fishermen dropped him off. He walked up the beach the fishermen drove away. He didn't want them to see anything because for one, he didn't want them to feel like they had to respond if something bad happened. Two, he didn't want a fishing boat off the, the beach to be a threat to the, 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 the islanders. He wanted them to feel like they were unthreatened. He was unarmed. He was ready to go. And so the next morning when the fisherman, fishing boat came back, they saw the islanders burying John in the sand on the beach. What happened between? We have no idea. John asked that his body not be recovered. He didn't want anyone else to be put at risk. And he wanted to be buried with the people that he felt God had called him to be. And again, imagine if he was your kid. Imagine if he was your brother or sister. Imagine if he was one of our church members. Tertullian, a second century author, was quoted as saying, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You've probably heard that before. And I want to read you some words of, of Paul uh, before we get to the end here. The same guy that was holding the coats, he wrote this in Philippians 2. 5 through 11, he says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to use to his own advantage. Rather, he, this is Jesus, made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. This is Jesus we're talking about. Look at verse 8. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on the cross. Verse nine, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why did Stephen die? Why did John Chow die? The same reason that Jesus died, to bring glory to God the Father. To spend themselves on behalf of a, need, of a world in need. And what an incredible, incredible moment that is. So let me just ask you, what is my encouragement to you today? To go try to find someone who will kill you for your faith? It reminds me of uh, my army days. I was uh, at basic training. Now, if you were at a different branch of service, you might have heard something similar. And I'm not trying to disparage anyone. But my uh, drill sergeant said, listen, men. <clears throat> We're the army. We train you to live for your country. We're not the Marines. They train you to die for your country. They said, we don't want heroes. We want soldiers. Those are the kind of things they would say. And uh, my Marine friends tell me that they said the exact same thing and opposite at their, uh, their Marine training school. And I want you to hear this. This is really important. My goal is not to encourage your death. My goal is to encourage your faithfulness. Let's live lives daily that cause us to be like Jesus. And, and if some people would go through such extreme uh, actions to try to get the gospel to the lost, how could we do anything less? Live your life daily as if it matters. Use your life in a way that brings glory to God. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. And today, while the worship team leads us, I just want to encourage you, if you feel led to come to the front and pray and devote yourself to the God that demands, he demands our lives for his sake, mostly for the life that we live to be devoted to him, but even if he were to call us to our death, that we would be found faithful. In these next few minutes, search your heart. And ask yourself, are you living the life that God has called you to live? Is your faithfulness one that is worthy of his sacrifice? You might think of the, the Hebrews 12 that says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, 
Let us throw off the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We are the beneficiary of thousands of years of followers of Jesus being faithful to to him and all of them being willing to share the gospel to the next generation. Let's make sure we're not the last link in that chain. Today, as we worship, as we sing, take a few moments and seek the Lord. If you'd like to talk to somebody, if you've never made Jesus your king, come and talk to us. We'd love to pray with you. If you're going through some difficulty, you're just not sure that you're living in a way that you need and you want someone to pray with you, there's gonna be worship, uh, some prayer warriors here at the front. But in these next few minutes, make things right with the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we know that you are the one who gives us everything that we have, that God, you forgive us, you call us, you love us, and Father, you spend us. We pray, God, today that we would put all, of we, all that we have in your hands. The Lord, our very lives are yours. We pray, God, that you would call each one of us to love you with all that we are, that we would hold nothing back, that we would reserve nothing for ourselves, and that, Father, you would be glorified in us. In the next few minutes, church, let's respond to what God's doing.